On May 28, 2021, Disney's live-action remake of the classic animated movie 101 Dalmatians, titled Cruella, was released in theaters and on Disney+. Now, I never actually watched this movie, so why am I talking about it? Well, if you were on movie Twitter at all during its release, you may have heard about Cruella's tragic backstory. That is, her parents were killed by a pack of aggressive Dalmatians, turning her into the villainous dog hater she is presently. Many online found this scene to be absolutely hilarious, including me. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't also make me shrivel up inside. This is because Cruella's newfound backstory is a symptom of a larger problem in Hollywood, one that has become quite prevalent in the last decade. That is, the collective notion that 3D villains, actually just 3D characters in general, are inherently better than 2D characters. So, if you're a fan of media, any media really, it's possible you've heard of the word flanderization at some point. If you haven't, I'll give you a little rundown. According to Wikipedia, flanderization is, quote, the process through which a fictional character's essential traits are simplified over the course of a serial work, end quote. The term originates from the character of Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, a notorious example of, well, flanderization. I've heard some people define flanderization as, quote unquote, reverse character development, but while shorter, I don't think that's a very accurate way to describe this phenomena. Character development can be either positive or negative. Overall though, it implies some sort of change in a character's psyche. So to say reverse character development would imply that a character is unchanging or static, which isn't what's going on here, so I'm going to stick with the Wikipedia definition. There are many examples of flanderization out there, but I'm going to talk about the ones that have irritated me the most personally. Exhibit A, Jim Hopper from Stranger Things, a man who over the course of the first two seasons became more empathetic, caring, and self-sacrificing, but was turned into an emotionally stunted, hot-headed, overprotective father in the third season. Exhibit B, Kevin Malone from The Office. Admittedly, Kevin was not very complex to begin with, but while not the sharpest tool in the shed, his immature sense of humor gave him charm. Whose butt is that? Mine. Oh, how did I not guess that? And he still had his own life and relationships outside of the office. As the show went on though, Kevin became a perverted oaf who couldn't tell his right from his left. So me think, why waste time? Say lot word when few word do trick. If you haven't caught the pattern yet, all in all, flanderization is the oversimplification of a character over the course of a media's run, often reducing them to a few simple traits present since their introduction. Now, why do people hate flanderization so much? Well, we, as humans, are emotionally complex creatures. So when we see emotionally complex characters on screen, we can empathize with them and sometimes see ourselves in them. This understanding of their motives, backstory, behaviors, hopes, etc., creates a bit of an emotional attachment, even if subconsciously. So to see them stripped of their complexity is like watching someone you care about become an empty shell of their former selves. Okay, but why am I talking about flanderization? This essay is titled The Death of the 2D Character, not The Death of the 3D Character. Well, it's because I think that as discussion of flanderization has become more popular, a lot of people, fans and professionals alike, have taken the statement that turning a 3D character into a 2D character is bad to mean that 3D characters are inherently better than 2D characters, which cannot be further from the truth. So I'm here to defend the second dimension. And who better to start with than Gravity Falls' very own Bill Cipher, a being literally from the second dimension? So who is Bill Cipher? Well, technically, he's an equilateral triangle made of pure energy. He found his home dimension limiting, so he destroyed it, fleeing to the Nightmare Realm, a realm between dimensions, with the ultimate goal of making it into the third dimension. This is very bad news, though, since to humans, Bill is basically chaos incarnate, having a strong distaste for order and systems. You know, all the things humans rely on to live. Literally. You've got your nervous system, skeletal system, lymphatic system, the list goes on. Which makes Bill such a terrifying villain because he has absolutely no regard for any of those things. The show does a fantastic job of displaying how little Bill cares for life. Anything will be possible! I'll remake a fun world! I think this scene is, in all honesty, one of the scariest things I've ever watched. The way he could so easily destroy everyone and everything is dread-inducing. Seriously, I thought about this 5 second clip days after watching it. But moments like that are what ultimately raise the stakes. That make me understand the gravity, no pun intended, of the protagonist's situation and how dire it is to defeat him. 
So I've answered the main questions. Who is Bill? What's his plan? Why do I consider him to be such a scary villain? There's something missing here though. The final and most important question. Why? Why is Bill such an anarchist? Why is he willing to go to immense lengths to abolish rules and order? I mean, he literally destroyed his entire home dimension just because he found it too limiting. Well, you see, when Bill was a kid, his parents were really, really strict, so he was never allowed to play with the other kids his age. No, obviously not, because that's stupid. Not every villain needs some tragic backstory that explains why they are the way they are. Bill likes chaos because he thinks it's fun, it's new, it's unpredictable. That's all there is to it and all there needs to be to it. The fact that this character finds so much intrinsic value in things not making sense is a huge part of why he's such an entertaining character. His deep-rooted love for disorder isn't relatable to us, and that's what makes him interesting. Let's move on to another example, though. Beauty and the Beast is by far one of my favorite Disney movies. The characters are charming, the songs are catchy, the animation is fantastic, and its story of patience and growth is incredibly heartwarming. What I want to focus on, though, is the movie's villain, Gaston. Gaston is an entitled, self-obsessed prick. He's aware of his strength and good looks, and takes that to mean he's owed a marriage to only the most beautiful woman in town, Belle. Belle isn't interested though, as she and Gaston couldn't be more different. This doesn't deter him at all though, as he justifies her dismissive behavior as a simple game of hard to get. This works for him because, well, Gaston has a massive ego that's only inflated by his environment, as best shown in his musical number, Gaston. The whole town worships the ground he walks on. For there's no man in town half as manly, <clears throat> perfect a pure paragon. Gaston is the epitome of traditional masculinity and he knows it. So as the pinnacle of manhood, of course he believes it's his duty to rescue Belle from the beast. When Belle defends the beast's character though, Gaston's black and white view of the world is challenged. If he's so great, then the beast, his competitor, the one who's keeping him from having the girl he so rightfully deserves, must be bad. If the beast isn't all bad though, as Belle claims, then maybe Gaston isn't all that great. That's definitely not a thought his ego can handle though. So even though Belle has been set free and the beast shows no desire to hurt her or the town, Gaston sets out to kill him anyways. Gaston's character never changes. He has no tragic backstory or reasoned motives. He's just a guy who won the genetic lottery and has been feeding his ego because of it ever since. And that's fine! We don't need some sad backstory. Gaston's a jerk and it's okay for him to be just that. In fact, it's one of the things that makes him so great. His egoism and inability to consider any sort of nuance in a situation is entertaining. The movie wouldn't be the same without him and his lack of complexity is what we have to thank for that. At this point, you may have noticed that the examples I've viewed so far have both been villains, so I want to talk about a character that isn't a villain. Papyrus from Undertale is arguably one of the most popular characters to come out of the indie RPG. And it's not surprising he made such an impression on players, as his demeanor is hard to ignore, with his constant yelling, inability to understand any sort of subtlety, and extreme optimism. He also has a massive ego, but while he definitely thinks way too highly of himself, he also thinks way too highly of everyone else, so he's still actually very likable. While Papyrus is an incredibly unique character, I honestly can't think of any tropes he fits into, he is probably the most two-dimensional character in the game. Let me explain. So in Undertale, you've got, I'd say, eight main characters. Sans, Papyrus, Alfie's Undying Toriel, Asgore, Meditin, and Plowy. Now, on a normal playthrough of the game, I'd say Sans, Alfie's Toriel, and Asgore are pretty three-dimensional, while characters like Papyrus, Undyne, Meditin, and Flowey are more two-dimensional. In a pacifist run of the game, where you don't kill anyone, things stay pretty much the same, except for Flowey, who becomes a more three-dimensional character upon learning his backstory in the final battle. The genocide run, though, is where things get interesting, as you, the player, start to push the residents of the underground to their limits by going out of your way to kill everyone. Meditin, a character who is reliably known to be a flamboyant, self-obsessed TV personality, becomes someone filled with an earnest desire to protect the community that supported him over the years, even if it means losing his own life. Undyne, a character normally known to be the loud and aggressive jock type, becomes a devoted knight with a deep sense of justice, even managing to postpone death out of a sheer desire for retribution. Flowey, an apathetic psychopath, becomes a trembling coward upon coming to the harrowing realization that you're more powerful and potentially more sadistic than he is. Papyrus is the only character that doesn't change in the genocide run. Down to his very last moments, he still believes in you, that you can do better, that you can be better, that you are better. And frankly, that's what makes this fight one of the most emotional ones in this run of the game. 
As fun as it is to see seemingly perpetually enthusiastic characters break down, because when I need a job done, I get someone with a job to do that job! What are you saying? I think Toby Fox did something really smart by allowing Papyrus to remain as a two-dimensional character even as his world is crumbling around him. While everyone else at this point in the game has started to see you for the threat that you are, and you, the player, know you aren't going to relent on your killing spree since, you know, then it would no longer be a genocide run, Papyrus maintains every shred of hope and optimism that he had in every other route of the game, encouraging you to choose a different path for yourself. He's never afraid or angry, and that's what's so impactful about it. Okay, so most of the examples I've given have been from more well-known pieces of media so you can really get the picture. But I wanted to talk about my absolute favorite example, one that is less known about in pop culture. Captain Davidson from the novel The Word for World is Forest by Ursula K. Le Guin. Unless you're into sci-fi literature, you probably haven't heard of this novel. However, you may have heard of a little movie called Avatar, of which there is heavy speculation that Le Guin's story served as the inspiration for. So, in the Word for World is Forest, humans from Earth, referred to in the story as Terrans, have depleted nearly all their native resources, so they've taken to the stars to find more. One group of Terrans ends up on a planet called Athshi for the purpose of harvesting wood. The issue is, though, that there is already a native population of beings on that planet, the Ashtheans, who live within the forest and depend on it for their livelihood and well-being. As a result, there arises an inevitable conflict between the two races. The novel is told from three different points of view. Captain Davidson, a Terran military officer in charge of ensuring Terran safety and progress, Raj Lyubov, a Terran anthropologist dedicated to studying Athshian culture, and Salver, an Athshian native, former slave of the Terrans, and leader of the Athshian revolution. I want to focus on Captain Davidson in particular. While the description I just gave of him may not have sounded too bad, insight into his actions, and even worse, his thoughts, shed light on truly how horrible he is. He's essentially Captain Qualrich from Avatar, but 10 times more stubborn, full-on sadistic, and borderline delusional. He was also my favorite character in the book. The reason why I liked Captain Davidson so much is for the very reason I'm making this video. Davidson is, in my opinion, a perfect example of why 2D characters can add so much to a story and its message. Captain Davidson is the opening point of view for the book and very quickly reveals to the reader exactly the kind of man he is. He is dead set on exploiting the Athshian world and prides himself in his loyalty to Earth. He's incredibly nationalistic and will go to great lengths to ensure he carries out his mission as a Terran. He displays immense disregard for Athshians, speaking of them as if they were animals and treating them harshly and violently. He firmly believes in Terran superiority, saying things like, Earth is a tame planet and New Tahiti isn't. That's what he was here for, to tame it. Can't keep us down, we're men. You'll learn what that means pretty soon. And New Tahiti was intended for humans to take over. It's man that wins, every time. The old conquistador. This attitude is maintained throughout the entire story and his core values do not budge, even when things start to go downhill for the Terrans. The first major event in the story occurs when Salver, the leader of the Athshian Revolution, massacres about 200 Terrans in a satellite community. Davidson, without approval of his higher-ups, organizes a retaliation massacre against the Athshians who live in the nearby forest area. This prompts a group from the overseeing committee of the Terran operation, the Interstellar League of Humans, to visit the planet. This is also when Lyubov, the anthropologist, reveals the severity of mistreatment towards the Athshians by the Terrans. The committee subsequently orders them to liberate all Athshian slaves and to update their wood harvesting protocols to align with modern human values using a new communication device that is unaffected by time dilation. These orders are surprisingly met with overall understanding and little resistance from the Terrans, except for Davidson, who remains firm in his beliefs and only becomes more angered as these new changes are implemented, even accusing the communication device of being run by artificial intelligence and not actual people. He simply can't accept the possibility that the Human Interstellar League may not want to be completely ruthless to a native population of sentient beings. Despite making some changes though, the Terrans do continue to harvest the forests, so the Athshians plot a massive attack against the Terrans to get them to stop once and for all. When the attack happens, many Terrans are killed and those in charge begin to consider that harvesting the planet isn't worth the trouble. The Athshians greatly outnumber them and are far more coordinated than they had previously anticipated. Davidson becomes infuriated by this attitude and begins to think he is the only sane person left, the only true Terran on the mission. 
Overall, throughout the story, Davidson does all he can to separate himself from anyone or anything that supposedly challenges his self-appointed duty to prove Terran superiority. When his superior tells him to refrain from retaliation after the second Athshian attack and pull back to Central to save his troops, Davidson calls him a fool, refusing to, quote-unquote, betray the human race, hangs up on him, and immediately instigates a retaliation against the Athshians. This unrelenting congruence to his values, no matter how obvious it is that he is vulnerable and disadvantaged, ultimately, and unsurprisingly, leads to his downfall. During his attempted retaliation, his aircraft crashes, he is overwhelmed by Athshians, and only after begging for his life is sentenced to solitary confinement on a remote island to succumb to his own madness and delusion. The thing with Davidson is that despite literally everyone, even his own kind, turning against him by the end of the story, he remains so stuck in his mindset that he perpetuates a war in his mind that the Terrans didn't really want to be a part of and frankly, had already lost. He was literally the only one who thought the way he thought and yet would not or could not consider that he may have been misguided. It's infuriating to read. But that's why it works, and that's why he's such a good character. The author of this story, Ursula K. Le Guin, wrote this book during the Vietnam War. If you know your history, you'll know that there was a huge anti-war movement in the United States during this time, as many Americans viewed the war as unnecessary and cruel. Le Guin was one of those people, and she wanted to use Captain Davidson to personify the ideology of the government at the time, which was, in her opinion, overly caught up in proving its strength, superiority, and values. So, in her words, she, quote, created Davidson as pure evil, even though she didn't believe purely evil people existed, end quote. Davidson was not written to be a complex character, as I explained previously. He is very two-dimensional, but that's what made him not only a great antagonist and character, but an impressive critique of militarism as a whole. Through him, Le Guin was able to make her point more blatant. She could personify concepts into her story easily without having to worry that some readers would get caught up in the more sympathetic and humanized parts that typically come with three-dimensional villains. By making Davidson such an explicit representation of militaristic patriotism, she could really hammer down her point that the superiority complexes and unrelenting aggression towards Vietnam by the US military was unethical. And honestly, you could even make the argument that through Davidson's fate, she was arguing that that very attitude could be the downfall of the United States itself. So after everything we've learned from the characters I've mentioned so far, let's discuss a situation where I think a character would have benefit from being more two-dimensional. That's right, I want to talk about the Wunzler, the Illumination Studios version, to be clear. And yes, I'm aware this is the second time I'm bringing up a Tumblr sexy man in my video. It's not my fault that they're just such a good examples. But anyways, if you've watched Illumination Studios' interpretation of the Lorax, you're likely familiar with the song, How Bad Can I Be? What you might be less familiar with, though, is the song, Biggering. Biggering was originally going to be the Wunzler's main number before getting replaced with, How Bad Can I Be? It made it pretty late into the stages of production though, so there's a full recording of it on YouTube with the accompanying storyboard. I'll link it so you can watch it before continuing with this video if you want, although you won't really need to since I'm not comparing the songs in terms of which one I think is musically better, rather I want to compare the images of the one slur these songs create, since both songs give insight into the one slur's rise to riches. As for what these songs have in common, well, they both give the same general outline for the series of events that led to the one slur's success. As a young entrepreneur, the Wunzler hoped to create a product that would be worthwhile. He eventually came across a truffle tree, and discovering that its tufts made for great fabric, created a multi-purpose item called a Thneed. This product boomed in popularity, and gradually, the Wunzler's initial concerns for the well-being of the truffle trees and its ecosystem decayed, leaving him incredibly wealthy and the surrounding environment void of any natural life. Where these songs differ, though, is how they explain the Wunzler's actions. Why did he do what he did if at some point he did genuinely care for the environment? What caused his morals to break down as they did? Well, in How Bad Can I Be, the Wunzler spends most of the song trying to convince himself that his actions aren't that wrong. He's just following the natural order of things, embracing progress. After all, change is inevitable. You can tell in the song, though, that he may not fully believe what he's saying, but pushing through and convincing himself because of his family. Since the Wunzler is the only member of his family that shows any actual promise, intellectual or otherwise, his family puts pressure on him to be successful. So the Wunzler gradually concedes to his desire for his family's approval. I'm not saying that this backstory or these motives are completely ridiculous. Familial expectations are real, but it's just not enough. It's not enough of a reason to explain how morally apathetic he became at the end of his entrepreneurial endeavors. 
which is where biggering comes in. In the song Biggering, the Wensler isn't trying to convince himself that what he's doing is okay in order to keep going, because the Lorax, in his mid-song monologue, points out something more sinister at work. The Wensler's greed, and even more so, his pride, has gotten the better of him. A taste of success has inflated his ego and sucked him into a cycle where the more he succeeds, the bigger his ego becomes, and the harder it is to satiate. He's not destroying an entire ecosystem just so mommy will stop nagging him. He's destroying it because he's smart, because he's rich, because he's successful, because if he wants to maintain his newfound sense of pride, he needs more. The Wensler finds intrinsic value in biggering, and in my opinion, that's a much more plausible way to explain how he pushed his company to the point that he did. It's kind of ironic, really. By simplifying the character's motives from gain family's approval to satiate inferiority complex from years of being treated like a disappointment to he let it get to his head, the message of the movie actually deepens. I think we can all agree that the Lorax ultimately pushes an environmentalist message. But Bickery makes that message so much more impactful because it shows how easy it is to justify destruction with only the simplest of motivations. We all have pride and we all have an ego we, whether we notice it or not, want to protect. Maybe we won't all go to the same lengths that the Wunsler did to protect it, but we're all capable of doing some not-so-great things because we find intrinsic value in maintaining our perception of ourselves. And it's okay for characters in media to show that. In fact, I think it's important that they do, as it encourages viewers to analyze their behaviors by looking inwards instead of blaming every crappy thing they do on some aspect of their past. So after talking extensively about these characters, I hope I've made my point clear. I don't know who's going to watch this video, but if there are any aspiring writers or storytellers out there, don't shy away from creating two-dimensional characters. And if there are any media critics out there, reassess the connotations you have with the phrase two-dimensional as you're reviewing and or analyzing a piece of media. It's okay for a character to lack depth. In fact, I think it can really enhance a piece of media. I really hope Hollywood realizes this again, and soon. Anyways, if you've sat through this whole video, thank you so much and leave a comment if you want to discuss anything further. And if you've enjoyed what you watched, consider leaving a like and checking out some of my other content. Thanks!